Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you this month's installment of E4C's webinar series, focusing on how a data-driven management operating system can help eradicate global poverty. My name is Mariela Machado, and I'm Program Manager here at Engineering for Change. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. The webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on the slide. Information on upcoming webinars is available on our webinars page. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org as seen on the slide. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenters, I would like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than one million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, ICTs, and more. We invite you to become a member of E4C membership of E4C. It's free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies on our solutions libraries, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we'll be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to visit our web website at engineeringforchange.org to learn more and sign up. If you're interested in learning more about, our, about tools and enable data collection related to water systems, we invite you to explore the E4C Solutions li Library after the webinar. An example of the type of tech that you'll find is the mWater Explorer mobile app, which allows users to map water resources and sanitation facilities and report functionality, water quality, or sanitary inspection reports using standard forms. The app allows the user to test a water source, take a picture of the results, and upload them, upload them to an online database for other users to see and use. The full report in the Solutions Library provides more information about technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models of the system. All of the information is sourced by E4C's research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts. And it's available to E4C members free of charge, so be sure to take advantage of this resource. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice using the WebEx platform by telling us where you are in the world. So, in, so let's do that right now. Let's uh, hear where you're all coming from. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type your location. The chat is not open on your screen. Try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. You can use this window to share remarks during the webinar as well. So let's start by hearing where you all are joining us from. So just type uh, where you're joining us from. There, I, I will start as well. London, UK, we're joining from New York. Seattle, Washington, Indiana, welcome everyone. 
And if you have any technical questions, just send a private chat to Engineering for Change admin. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter. Again, if you don't see it, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You might also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. If you see webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour to request to request your PDH, please sign in and go to your member dashboard to access the PDH form. Great, so let's get down to business. I would like first to take a moment now to tell you a bit about our presenters today. First, we have Annie, Annie I, I hope I said it right, Fury. <laughs> Annie Fury who is a behavioral, behavioral health scientist specializing in management systems, behavior change, and global health. She's the co-founder and CEO of Mwater, a tech startup that leverages real-time cloud-based management tools to catalyze the work of health professionals and governments around the globe. Dr. Fieri is the mother of three children and lives in New York. To our next presenter, uh, we have Petri Audio. Petri Audio is the product man manager for Mwater, responsible for the ongoing development of the mobile data management platform. Previously, he was the system advisor for, for planning, monitoring, evaluation, and reporting at WaterAid UK, involved in rolling out a global MIS, as well as mobile data collection processes. So without further to say, I will pass here the mic to our presenter, Annie. Great, thanks so much. Thank you all for your time. I'm very grateful to have the chance to talk to you today. Uh, we're going to be speaking about a general uh, overview and introduction to the MWater platform with a little background about why we took some of the uh, decisions that we did in, in creating it. Um, the first thing that we'd like you to understand is our core values and our motto that drives everything is what gets measured gets done. And so our approach as a nonprofit organization working in uh, the world's global uh, poverty eradication effort is to measure better, to help all of the stakeholders from governments to NGOs to multilaterals and academic researchers approach this by more efficient and more collaborative measuring. The center of the platform and what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today is surveys. And so I want to explain that for, for an NGO, surveys are M&E. For an academic researcher, a survey is your instrument. And for governments, surveys are the engine of all of governance. They're actually how the management gets done. So you might think of the health worker as being the furthest reach out from the central government to the communities. And the health worker does his or her job by conducting basically a survey. They go house to house and check on how many children are there. Is, is, is there a new baby? Is mom able to breastfeed? Is there a hand washing station? And they then send that survey to their supervisor. And their supervisor creates an assemblage of surveys as well that is the result of the surveys to report up to the central government once or twice a year. For the first 74 years of the aid industry, this was a process that happened on paper. And this is the, the main reporting is what I'm, I'm showing you a wall at a healthcare facility in Tigray, Ethiopia. This is the reporting on vaccination rates. And so what, what we did was we, we took this very efficient effort and tried to make it efficient and actually sharing the data further. In the, in, in the more developed countries, surveys are also how work gets done. You might be familiar with the Checklist Manifesto. It's a book about uh, the, the effectiveness of checklists, which are in effect surveys for everything from flying airplanes to nurses uh, being more efficient at, at treating their patients. So what we did was take the paper-based survey interface that was so well understood in the international aid community and turn it into a digital interface that could the surveys can be done on a, on a mobile phone or a tablet. It's a next billion rigorous technology, so it can handle working offline or online. 
And uh, as soon as the person's back in service, the, the survey syncs with the cloud. And everyone that has permission to see that data from the managers to the stakeholders to the central government, or if there are various NGOs within their own NGO, they would be able to instantly see the results of those surveys. So it, what, it turned what was a once or twice a year understanding your data process into an instant interactive process. This was a, a very quick way to say how over the past six years we grew this platform to include over 45,000 NGOs, uh, governments, um, uh, academic researchers, and local community organizations who can all work together because they share this relational database. They can, they can collaborate as much as they want or they can keep their data as private as they want in their data collection work. So basically, we've tried to create what is an um, um, operating system for managing your work in low resource regions. What this looks like in practice is a mobile app called Surveyor. You can use it as a web app at surveyor.mwater.co, or it's a free download in the iOS and Android stores that works on and offline to communicate with a data management portal. And you can see the portal at portal.mwater.co. What we encourage people to understand is the platform is there to help the longitudinal management of stable sites. These sites might be water sources, uh, water systems, healthcare facilities, uh, schools. We can, we can then map those to where they can then be surveyed against over time, creating the opportunity for longitudinal management. We can also map them to each other so that a survey about a, 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 health, a, a healthcare facility and a survey about a water point near the healthcare facility can be used together to understand how much access to safe water is functionally there for healthcare facilities. The surveys themselves can be attached to a site, but they don't have to be. We encourage the, the, the process of management and monitoring to include physical locations. They can also be attached to a site privately or a geographic point privately without making it a site by just using the GPS question type. As you update the status of your point over time, if you're managing, say, a water system, a utility with its various water points, multiple surveys over time are used to create a day-to-day -day management system instead of the old-fashioned project model of now and then sending someone out to check how things work. We, the, the, the sum total of this is a workflow that we see works well for management. So, uh, as well as for NGOs that are doing their m and &E and reporting to donors. So you can see how if you're working in, in the government's frame of mind, you can use the same system with some slight changes. And if you're working from an NGO perspective or an academic perspective, you can also uh, use the exact same system. Over time, we've grown very fast, grown very exponentially to uh, collect about 150,000 surveys a month to map about 60,000 new sites a month, but more importantly, to update over 100,000 sites per month. So we're very happy that the, the growth of the platform uh, is taking off in this exponential way. We also uh, hope that you all will jump in and, and try it out and share this platform with your colleagues because it is a free platform that becomes more valuable over time with more users. So now I'm going to uh, introduce you to my colleague, Petri, who's going to talk more about the nuts and bolts of how this actually works. All right, thanks, Annie, for the good overview, and hello, everybody. Yes, indeed, I'm the product manager, and uh, that was exactly what I was going to begin with. I want to jump, jump in from that overview to the nuts and bolts and get you excited um, about the platform and show you how quick and easy it can be for any user just signing up and logging in for free to get a visualization going using the public information available. I'll reveal a brand new feature we just got out yesterday. And then for the second part, I'll talk uh, about one of our larger and more exciting collaborations where we've scaled up uh, to a whole, whole country's data collection efforts and, and management efforts. So quite a bit of this I'll be doing straight in the platform. So I'll be sharing my screen here. Data available. So um, this is me having just logged into the platform. Uh, it's the same view as you would get. I'll just refresh because we've already got a update going. And um, there's a number of features we won't have time to touch on today. But um, as soon as you've logged in, you'll be able to start building visualizations on the basis of 
information that's already there in the system and, and that has been shared with the world. And what I wanted to just build uh, is a bit of a dashboard looking at uh, Guinea-Bissau. So I've gone to, to a dashboard. So what we intend with that is sort of a, a punchy one page, one view visualization that gives you something valuable to look at. Um, if you want to combine many dashboards into one bigger story, use consoles. If, uh, within dashboards, you can have maps and tables and, and all the things you see here on the left side on a palette. So imagine this as a blank canvas that you can create to be um, what you want it to be, configure it, and then share it with as wide an audience as you like. So I'm going to drag a chart. I want to show some water point information about Guinea-Bissau. Um, I want to show it by type. I'm going to get a suggestion to, to save my dashboard so that it's saved. So I'll do that. And now we've got our blank chart in front of us. So the next step is to click into it. And um, it gives me the options that are available for different chart types. I'll start with something basic. I'll just add a bar chart. And then I get taken to the next view, which gives me all the options available to me um, of a data source. OK? So the system understands that uh, I want to build a chart. I want to build a bar chart. What data do I want to feed it with? Um, well, this is all, all publicly available information already. It can get quite complicated. Surveys, as Annie was talking about, the real heart of what's going on, and then sites, these persistent infrastructure locations. Um, I'm going to choose the first one for simplicity, um, water points. And then it will ask me, OK, you want to map a water point. What do you want to map about that? I know we've got different preset types. And so I'll start setting the horizontal axis. Now, here we get a fairly complicated view of all the possible things about a water point you might want to visualize. I think the key takeaway for all of you would be anything you see here is something that you can bring into your visualization. And anything that you, you track, you create a survey for in MWater, um, you can bring into your visualizations and your analyses. So the complexity is there, but you can navigate that. I'm just going to choose the type because I want to map and, and visualize water points by type. OK, so I get, again, completely uh, openly, something that I didn't need to ask permission for. I just signed up, logged in, and created um, a view of all the water points by type that have been made publicly visible as sites in Guinea-Bissau. I'll do a bit of tweaking. I'll make it horizontal, let's say. Maybe I want to color it nicely, so I'll, I'll ask to set individual colors and set a little color scheme. Maybe add um, a little title, fairly straightforward things that you'll get to grips with once you start playing with it. Uh, let's say by type, and name the series as well for completeness. And then I can X out of this view and get a chart. Well, that's pretty nice, but if we want to take this to the next level, um, of course, we want to have different types of things to juxtapose. And what's brilliant is, like with many other business intelligence solutions these days, if you have the same relational database, all the data in the same place, you can then bring in multiple visualizations, multiple charts, maps, and so on, and uh, interact with them such that if you filter one, then the others respond to that. So that's what I'm going to do next by taking a map. Let's juxtapose this chart um, with a map. So I've dragged from the left the palette uh, a map onto the canvas on the right, exactly what you can do as well. And I'm going to start configuring it from the cogwheel on the right. And again, we're focusing on water points. The key thing is if you want the widgets to interact with each other, you want to make sure it's pointing at the same kind of data source so the system understands it's the same thing. So we're looking at water points here. Um, let's maybe filter down to Guinea-Bissau. That's what we want. I'm typing here, finding the country, country name. So if I have picked by the country name, I'm able to filter um, because the system understands if a point is in a geographical location in the world, then it must be in this district and must be in this region and must be in this country. It's going to take a tiny second here to load the list of countries. There we go, Guinea-Bissau. So now we don't need to render all of the points in all of Africa and all of the world. We can just filter down to the ones in Guinea-Bissau. Well, that's already really nice. It's a good example from the point of view of having tons and tons of water points mapped. Um, maybe we'd want to make it more consistent um, with um, 
the type. So if I color by data and select the color scheme to match what I just chose, then I'll have the nice consistency between the bar chart and the map. Um, and that gives us our first layer. Well, this is already neat. So now if I only wanted to look at protected springs, I can click it here, for example, and see all the protected springs on the map. So that's nifty and click out of it or have multiple filters. So this is just to give you a flavor of these are just two widgets, two data points, two kinds of things to look at. Um, but of course, it's going to get more powerful if you're able to juxtapose it with other relevant information, maybe household information, maybe communities, schools, health facilities. And we'll look at that in the example. But here I wanted to share something I'm really excited about, which is a brand new feature from yesterday, which is um, population density layers for, for African countries. So I've gone back to the map. I'm um, adding a new layer here, and I've got this option since yesterday evening of population density. Now, if I choose Guinea-Bissau, it's going to add a layer straight to the map, uh, a layer that is visible because of the sheer amount of stuff that needs to be rendered at the city and district level. Um, so we'll start seeing uh, these points here in colored view. I think when we're juxtaposing with uh, water points that are themselves colored, I'd rather have it in grayscale, so I have the option to do so. And here we have household information that we've plucked from the public domain from the humanitarian data exchange. I'm just reordering them to render the, uh, the households first. Um, that's been derived from satellite information and census data in a, in a big infrastructure enterprise using machine learning um, by Columbia University scientists and, and Facebook AI researchers that's now available to the public and what we're bringing even closer to um, to public consumption and, and consumption of the people who, who might be built in the business of building these management operating systems. So here we've just taken two layers and are juxtaposing them and we can see, okay, this community seems to be, there must be a community here based on this uh, analysis of households. And we can see that there are two different types of borehole and uh, protected dug well by the looks of things. So this is now available for almost all the countries in Africa, and that's just dependent on the source data set we have. And we have a, a nice post outlining the details of, of what this is and what you might want to do with this and, and the updating plans. So it's, uh, it's pretty thrilling to ex imagine how this might have an impact on, on operational management decisions if you have rapidly changing environments, urbanizing environments, changing demographics, and you have up-to-date um, population density data being up, uh, updated every three months currently and possibly more more frequently in the future. And, and again, this was just something that you could go right after this call and this webinar and do yourself and, and look, at a, look at a juxtaposition of data that's effectively never been looked at before. This was just released yesterday and nobody uh, had the time to look at Guinea-Bissau population density data and this water point data here. So, and that's how easy it is. Granted, I ran through it fairly quickly, but we do have documentation here up top in the help area. And uh, yeah, the sky's the limit with what you'd want to do. If you then wanted to share this with your colleagues, with anybody else, we've got a share link that allows you to create a shareable link so that people don't even need to log in to see it. They would just take the link and paste it and people can follow it and see this. So there we go. This is the first part I wanted to talk about, which is how to get started. And let's look at something that's gone way beyond this um, when it comes to, to stuff of actually using it. Uh, I'll present from here because we've got the GIF. Um, so this is a collaboration ongoing in Malawi with the Climate Justice Fund Water Futures Program, um, technically supported by the University of Strathclyde in, in Glasgow. Um, and it's, it's really thrilling because the ultimate aim is to establish a national level wash data management process. So not just an NGO's internal work, something like that, but something that really goes and covers the whole country. And, and here on the GIF on the right side, you see um, when, when mWater became the tool of choice for collecting data in 2017, you start seeing the, the big expansion in data collection and how, how um, the platform scales up to, to support all these points. As you saw in Guinea-Bissau, there's quite a few. So just a few points about what this is. Um, it's a long-standing um, government level 
collaboration between Scotland effectively and, uh, and Malawi. The Climate Justice Fund has been working in Malawi since 2011. I think the history goes all the way back to Dr. David Livingston a few hundred years ago. And, uh, and we've come on board in 2017 where the CJF began assessing every rural water point across Malawi, as well as potential risks to water quality such as sanitation and waste sites. And, uh, and a newer development that I'll talk about is that in late 2018, in collaboration with the government of Malawi, the CJF and its partners began developing a decision support tool for rural water supply investment using, using MWater as the, the digital interface layer. And, and here we see a few of the partners involved. And, and it's exciting and, and really valuable from my point of view that this is a government level collaboration. Um, it's absolutely key to get government on board no matter what technology you have. So again, jump soon to an interactive portion of this, but um, here I wanted to demonstrate even further the idea of what becomes possible and how you're able to ask better and better questions and make hope to make better operational decisions when you've got this one shared database of different kinds of data juxtaposed with each other. Okay, so hopefully everybody's aware of the SDGs, SDG 6.1 on water, and, um, and that's what, uh, part of a uh, smaller part of CJF has been to do household level surveys to establish the SDG 6.1 service level. And let's look at this layer here where all you see is households. Households mapped by their uh, service level. And of course, you're gonna start building a picture. Well, okay, if I had $10,000 to spend on an intervention, where might I go? Well, you see the, the surface water level service levels um, here on the bottom left, that might be the key area of intervention maybe bottom right when you've got dense population maybe you'd want to consider roads and, and where it's easy to access so there's some yellow limited service ones just by the roadside here on the top um, and that's what kind of questions you'll be able to see if you're just looking at a set of household surveys well that's that's good but what would happen if you start juxtaposing things so here we've added just the locations of water points that exist and we'll start getting a more granular picture so again, all in and water. So we discover this area on the on the left side where there's low coverage. There's a seemingly a long way to go to get to a water point. And the same at, at the top there uh, in the yellow area, maybe the reason they have a, a limited access, so limited service level is because there's just no water point nearby. So that refines our image, our thinking, our decision-making process from, from just having that one layer. Um, beyond that, since we were just looking at the locations of the water point, shouldn't we also, in an ideal case, have up-to-date information about how are those water points working? Are they give, you know, it's one thing having the infrastructure there, it's another thing actually being able to get reliable supplies of water from it. So here we've got that layer refined with blues uh, showing functional, ye yellow partially functional, red not functional. So we're discovering these, uh, we're discovering these condensed places of dense, population here um, where there seems to be a non-functional water point and knowing that rehabilitation is often cheaper than building and drilling new water points um, maybe this is now the right place to decide to intervene um, or right here but it's far from the road so maybe this is another option so again th these discussions and these decision making processes get more refined no water point here uh, a non-functional here but there is another one beside it that works so you're able to make this more nuanced analysis. And then you can keep going with this, and this is what the decision-making tool in Malawi is doing, has schools, okay? That might make an impact and the level of the school, primary, secondary, or something else. Um, this school, maybe it's not so important if you've got nearby alternatives, for example, here, but, but this one has a school, only one water point and a community next to it. So maybe we're honing in on this or this school. So. So this is just to demonstrate all these things. You could keep going and going depending on how you, your process is set up and what data you're collecting. But, but this is uh, getting really exciting with the decision support tool and not just to the point of making that decision, but also following up on it. So with MWater, it's possible, of course, to do, keep doing those longitudinal surveys and map by different time areas time zones, time dates. And here we can see what the situation was at the household level on the left in terms of drinking water service levels being quite biased towards limited and unimproved. Um, and then after an intervention here, having this water point built, 
visiting maybe slightly different households because the household heads weren't present and so on, and seeing a much different picture. So that gives us some empirical or gives the CJF pro program some uh, empirical evidence to say, look, this intervention really did make a difference. And we can, we can say that from many, many households having a more improved SDG service level. So, so I think this is a really exciting example of what's possible. And what's also nice in the few minutes I've got remaining is that there's an interactive console that's open to all of you to play with as well that we'll share um, with a number of tabs. So remembering consoles are a place in MWater where you can bring together as many tabs, dashboards, tables, and so on, and maps um, to build one coherent story. And, and this is kind of looking at what we just did, maybe starting from water points and juxtaposing some drinking water service levels. So this has been filtered down to be west of, uh, of Zomba. And it's rendering the, rendering the drinking water service levels. So we can do, and you can do the same kind of exercise and, and think, okay, well, what, uh, what does this tell us in terms of where might we want to invest? And you can imagine the government really being able to do a lot if this data when this data is properly uh, adopted into decision-making processes. And beyond that, we can, we can layer some schools as well. Ooh, might be my laptop uh, internet here, acting up a little bit. Um, okay, there we're coming. So just overlaying all of that. Other tabs as well show whatever is most useful. So it's, it's one thing knowing um, that the water point's there, you might want to understand seasonal variation. So of course, being an academic institution, uh, University of Strathclyde can be diving quite deep into technical reasons of failure and, and contextual elements, which can be very exciting. So here we see a, a school smack in the middle of a cluster of population, but all the water points seem to be working. So that situation is good, except north of this road. So if I just look at this part of Malawi for the first time with the data available, I'd start thinking, okay, well, what, why this seems really good. Um, and, but as soon as you get further away from the school, further away from the main road, or further north here, the situation isn't so good. Maybe there's a case then to use um, use this data to lobby lobby government, local government to make an intervention here, and so on for all of Malawi, effectively, well, depending on where these uh, drinking water service level surveys are done. The idea certainly isn't to do to do everything right now in terms of that, but. Um, as I said, this link is part of the slides and you'll be able to, to view all of it and explore. And this was presented a couple of months ago already. And, and the process of course is going on with solid commitment for, for many more years and a handover to government in the pipeline. So much exciting potential here, um, but I think that's all I wanted to share, uh, explore right now. So I'll hand this back over to Yuani once I get to the menu. Yeah, and then, there we go. All Great, right. thanks so much. I think an important thing to point out already, one of the questions I, that I um, that, that I saw come through is it just is a lot. This is a fire hose. And so one of the important things to point out is that we have featured dashboards available for you to look at and duplicate and begin playing with changing the data sources yourself. So there's two ways for you to jump in. And one is to go in, design a survey, deploy it to yourself, to your organization's users. We see a lot of organizations begin just with HR surveys. Did you get to work at eight o'clock, you know, spill out a survey when you got in and when you left? Just start making surveys. Start learning to drive every part of your management workflow with data, and then it, it grows very fast. And uh, we also have this advanced help library. You'll see the help button at the top of the portal that has a number of tutorials, videos, um, dashboards, uh, walkthroughs that can help you with most uh, of the aspects of the platform. The survey interface itself is designed in what's called a what you see is what you get interface. That means uh, you shouldn't need to know advanced coding to use it. It's about the level of fluency that is needed for Google Docs to be able to use this platform. One thing I also wanted to correct on myself that, that I wasn't clear to say that the portal does require you to have an internet connection to work. It can handle shoddy internet, but it does require you to, to be online. Uh, we recommend if you're in an area with low quality internet that you do your, your data management in the portal in the morning. Um, so just getting back to 
slide. Let's see. There we go. Um, let me just bump through these slides real fast. Sorry. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we uh, we talked about one more example. The 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 motivation of the platform design that we have is to try to increase efficiencies and let everybody work together to work faster and to catalyze people's progress. The idea is, especially in water, if everybody spends as much money as they have very well right now, there's still not enough to meet the SDG by 2030. So we've got to be finding more efficiencies and making investments turn over more time. And one of the ways you do that is to begin sharing your data collection environment. And let me show you what that looks like functionally. So this is a data console. A console is multiple dashboards, maps, data grids, or pivot tables that you put together as one MIS, as one data management workflow of all of the data that you've collected through your mapping of the sites and your conducting of the surveys. This console is run by the government of Haiti, who is also one of the countries that has taken up the platform for national level monitoring. This is to communicate to the NGOs working within Haiti what the government's priorities are. They're trying to bring everybody into the same page as to what, what we're working on. And let me show you a, a map that they're sharing with each other. You can see these data layers that we talked about, that uh, this is a population layer. The water points are then mapped by size of 500 meters access because that is the government's functional definition of access. And then whether they are potable by having met the, the standard, standard for safe drinking water uh, with the in-water test or other water quality tests, and whether, whether they are functional is also denoted by color. So if you look at the map in this way, the government and the NGOs can work together to make that really critical decision of uh, more efficient work and aid, which is where to spend the next dollar. And you can see where there's the most um, population but the least safe access or where there's the most distance access but the least functional access might change your strategies of how you're actually working to uh, to manage this water system. And then one other, move this away, one other layer that we can even add to this is ground, uh, the groundwater potential to even help you make your decision based on if this is a really important place that we need to meet. It has very little access but it's the hardest to reach by by boreholes, we definitely want to look at a piped system there, right? So one of the uh, things that's next for Mwater is piped systems. We're working with the government of Haiti to, uh, to, to release, now you can map water systems and you can map the water points within their components. And we'll also be adding uh, uh, piped management features uh, they, they can help people make decisions based on size of pipes, location of pipes, uh, uh, the the angle of pipes to better manage utilities and small water systems, uh, as opposed to what might have been our previous focus, was, which was very heavily uh, focused on um, wells and singular water points. Now, if you look at this environment that I've shown you, this is the government's view of the data set. But here is one of the larger NGOs working in Haiti called Haiti Outreach, and they've represented the same data set in this very donor-friendly way. They want to communicate to their donors how effective they're doing at, at spending the donor's money. So you can see how collaborating with the same relational database helps everybody meet their needs, and yet they don't have to be working disparately to, uh, to, meet, those, to meet those needs. The most important uh, part of, of, of the data collection cycle for an NGO might be to communicate the, the effective and safe and transparent use of the donor's money. So they're able to do that while the most effective part of the data collection cycle for the government is actually decision making and organizing of, of the stakeholders, including those NGOs. So just returning to the slides one more time. We, we want to make sure that, you know, one of the our, our biggest advance and our next step that we're moving toward is called Solstice. Uh, the, many of our users came to us and said, we're working in water and that's great, we found you in water, but we're also doing schools and, and healthcare facilities. And when I take this to my managers, they're not very happy with the, the outcome that I'm recommending to uh, use something called water. So merely for the point 
of having a brand agnostic uh, title, we've created the sister brand called Solstice. We're doing, a, it's, a, it's in soft beta launch now. We're doing a hard uh, launch June 21st on the Solstice. Our motivation is that the Solstice was the first data point that humans monitored to understand their world. And so this is a data-centric management platform that's made for uh, all sorts of aid industry and government focused management uh, approaches. We have a lot of uh, emerging interest in Solstice for uh, emergencies. For uh, we've, we've been very involved in the Cox Bazar refugee camp, for example, where checking on wash in healthcare facilities is as important as checking on uh, stockouts in healthcare facilities. And you can use the same platform for both. We have a lot of interest in schools, uh, in agriculture. So uh, Solstice, the app, is coming soon. The platform is already available for you to play with at solstice.global. We're, uh, we're looking forward to uh, growing out what we have as the Global Indicator Library, which is one of the ways, it's a Wikipedia-inspired library of data sets uh, and their associated indicators to help people learn even what to measure when you jump into the platform. So we want to give lots of time for your questions. So we're going to go ahead and uh, finish our presentation now formally, but we continue to uh, be able to answer your questions with some demonstrations. Uh, if, you, if you want to jump in with uh, more questions that you might have. Excellent. Thank you, Annie and Petri. That was super insightful. Um, we have a few questions here, so I will start with the first. Um, the tools you presented seem to be very powerful, but also a little overwhelming. Is technical support available for NGOs who would like help in setting up reports and dashboards? The, the, the quick answer is yes, absolutely. It's a little bit more complicated. If you want free support, we try to provide as much free support as we can in the, in the help button on the platform. But we do also charge for training and uh, can provide one day or a week full of training. We, we make the money that supports the platform off of customization and training. So we, we certainly like for people to write us into their funding if you're doing a funded pro program to try to include an in-water training. We think we're able to make your data collection process much more effective if you can include us at that level because we also help you bring in legacy data so that there's not a hard stop and end to when you began using the platform. And we can also help you align your data with national and international indicators, which uh, helps everyone continue to work together uh, more effectively. Great. Um, the next question is, how is currently or res recently updated data differentiated from older data in the tool and database? So, Petri, maybe you can talk more about filtering the data. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So every everything you collect, every survey that you submit has a date stamp attached to it, and everything that you collect in and water becomes something that you can filter by. So we've seen that a bit in action, but I could share my screen a bit um, if you like. But basically, either you use the time of submission of the survey, this is when we received or you received the data from the field, or you can add a date question to the field, so to the survey itself. And then whatever you have there, you can bring into a filter. You can use it as an axis in a chart, so like show by, by quarter, show by month, uh, the progress, for example, functionality, or we have some interesting stuff with sensors, which bring in daily data, and you can see the daily data over time, um, how much volume, how many hours of use was there. So it's no problem at all. OK. Excellent. So the hardest part of uh, the mobile data collection tools is to gather quality data. How do you ensure quality information and do you verify it? Oh, that's a really great question. So um, it's important to know that we're just the platform uh, provider. We don't do the actual implementation data collection, but the, the technology as we've designed it has many features that make it easy for you to collect higher and higher quality data. Um, the very low bar of that is to avoid text fields. We have lots of question types, and we have a big uh, help item in our help library about just how many question types we have. And so, for example, if you ask someone, uh, 
uh, to, to put in the date, we want you to use a date question type so that all of your data is standardized. This is the low bar of making sure that you have a high quality of data. The second is we, uh, we offer a secret time and date stamp and location stamp to be in the metadata under any question. I like to recommend people design their surveys to have this under the first question and the last question because one of the ways you can analyze your uh, user's activity later to see how high quality or low quality their survey data might be is how long they spent on the instrument. And if you've tested out this survey to be about 30 minutes and somebody's doing it in five, you might want to go in and do a much th more thorough job uh, cleaning and checking on their data. And then uh, cleaning itself is a very elaborate process. We allow approval stages and we have a cleaning dashboard that we build for you automatically that you don't have to build yourself to see your data's uh, visualized visualize results in real time as they come in. And this helps you to clean a, a survey. You can reject a survey back to the user and tell them, you know, obviously you got the location wrong, go back and fix this. Uh, we offer um, we offer tickets or issues. These are like uh, you can when someone has a problem, they can issue a, a ticket. We like to use this for broken uh, water points, for example. They can set off a series of rules. So all of this is moving your management into a structure where you can tell by visualizing the data when it is an unexpected result, and you can identify outliers straight away. One of, the, one of the rules that you, that you sort of follow in a data collection is the more similar reports uh, are, the more likely they are to be accurate. And, the, and an outlier is visually identified in a visualization very fast and, and should be investigated most. So I think, um, oh, and then just finally, I want to say as far as the quality of the data, uh, mm -hmm. our data belongs to the users. We, we do not own your data, you do. And so, if you're working as an organization, uh, you, you can decide just how many people see your data within your okay. organization or your entire organization. And you can also make sure that when you're reporting your data, you can report as your organization separately from you can report as the whole world. So if you have much higher data quality standards than, than you think uh, others do, you can only report on your data very easily. Got it. But um, expanding on that question, this is like out of curiosity. Petri mentioned that you also had layers of, for example, you know, the, the population, you know, density. Is this something that you guys mix them together? Like, do you offer that on the dashboard? Like, do you have this already embedded into the platform? Aside from, you know, the mobile data collection that that client, you know, might, ha might do on their own? Yes, yes, these are, these are standardized map layers that you can use to enhance the, the ability of your decision-making process. So uh, when we use a standardized map layer, such as um, uh, admin, admin boundaries is a good example of one that you can uh, say, like, this is the shape of this district, and I want data within this district. We use that from official sources only. We, we don't uh, publish just anyone's admin boundary. So this would be the government's official admin boundary. And then when it comes to population, this is the result of a very complex and large academic effort between uh, CSEN at Columbia and Facebook. To, uh, so it's also a rigorously validated uh, data layer. So anything that's there that you didn't collect as a data source yourself that is a map layer is from an official source. Got it, very interesting. Great. Our next question is regarding intervention. So, are there any potential applications that could help facilitate facilitate more sustainable management of water points, for example, as a tool for local level ex external support structures like district governments, circuit rider programs, area mechanics? Definitely. So, uh, first of all, this is an area we're interested in growing in, and the whole platform has been created. Uh, feature by feature when a partner, usually a stakeholder such as a multilateral institution or an NGO, comes to us and says, we love your whole platform, but we just wish it did a specific interface for circuit writers. And that's something that we would partner with you to build, and we would write that contract that what we build for you, we make free to the world. So first of all, just having said, we, we do want improved circuit writer interface. One of the things we're building right now is improved call center interface, which would work very well with that. Uh, one of the recent uses that show just how these uh, pieces work together that I'm, I'm very proud of 
recently Cyclone Adai hit uh, the eastern, uh, southeastern African countries, especially Mozambique and Malawi. And as you remember from Petri's presentation, Malawi is one of the countries that has already adopted in water-based management at the national level. And so due to the, the you know, the 845 square mile inland sea that was created by this storm, biggest natural disaster to hit the southern hemisphere this year. Um, due to the size of this storm, uh, many of the water points in rural Malawi were suddenly flooded and contaminated. And so the government was able to use the exact same monitoring system that was in place for uh, mapping and monitoring in good conditions. They sent out a survey that was to evaluate whether a water point was contaminated by, by flood water. And if the water was contaminated by the flood water, it led to a survey that was a recipe for remediating that, that water point. So you've got something that is a very dynamic and responsive management interface that was possible because all the NGOs and all of the local communities were communicating already in this infrastructure with the central government. Super interesting. Excellent, Any thanks. Okay, so our next question, uh, what technologies do you use to collect the initial data from remote areas and transport back to the RDBMS servers, then collection of follow-up data for monitoring and reporting? So then, yes, there's two questions there. So, Petri, maybe you can talk a little about, yeah. about specific sure. technologies. So absolutely, the basis of it are the apps that Annie mentioned in the beginning, so the, the Android app, the iOS app, and some the, the same that can run on a web browser. Now, there is extensive offline capability there, so we have enumerators who can go out into the field who have poor connectivity for their entire visit, and they can preload data onto their app, such as map cache layers and where sites are. And uh, then only once they get back to an area with connectivity does the automatic link to the cloud um, happen again. Um, and then there are a few additional exceptions. Well, really, the, the that's how it happens. There's no sort of local, uh, otherwise there's no SMS. Um, apart from the sensors I briefly mentioned, that is a bit of a different flow and that's something we've built so that it can be expanded and expanded uh, as a demand expand. So there, there is a satellite connected, in, in the case of Ethiopia by now, satellite connected sensors that then submit the data to the third party that handles it and we, we get the daily summary which we then do an import of. So we have a different mechanism going for that, but, but that's one branch of it, really the, the bulk of it is you have the app, you go to the field, don't worry about being in an area of connectivity, low connectivity as long as at some point you can expect to have a bit of internet. Got it. Excellent. And and the part, so for the, do you, it's the same mechanism for the follow-up data, right? For monitoring and reporting? So you have the same offline functionality and you usually gather that in the same way, correct? That's right. Okay. Excellent. Next question. We're using M water in Ethiopia and seems going well even in, in managing district data, but government has concerns of storing the data in the cloud than having a server in country. What is your experience in other countries like Ethiopia? I would say this is um, something that we try to be extraordinarily sensitive to. Uh, there is a little bit well, there's two nuances to this, to this answer. I, there, sometimes people think that it's possible to conduct a data collection platform with a mobile app and just keep it in the country. That's not possible. Your cell phone does touch other countries in its signal no matter what, even if you do see your servers locally. So what we offer in the case of Ethiopia's concern is a local server that can mirror all of the data there. This ensures that if there were ever a dispute with another country, that Ethiopia has their own data in their country. Uh, we don't see this as a concern as much as we used to. It, it's, a, it's growing. And one reason is there were some rather rudimentary technologies, I would say 10 years ago, that made it very difficult for technology platforms to, uh, to the, the cloud-based meeting was just very in its infancy. Now cloud-based computing is very common. Most people are getting more comfortable with it. Uh, but still, there's a safest response that we tell them is we can set up a local server, uh, GHIS2 does this, in the country that mirrors all the data so that you always have the most up-to-date copy yourself and no one could ever lock you out of your data. 
Got it. That's uh, it's a very valid concern. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, it's a very valid concern and it's moving more to the cloud. So where, following up on that question, where do you usually store the data in, in regular projects? We, we use Amazon Web Servers. It's all cloud-based. They're based around the world. Um, it's the same uh, industry level, highest safety technology that we can get because we're really writing on the backs of very large technology providers that have much more money and in capital to invest in security. We want to make sure we have the highest level of the encrypted and safe and uh, firewalled uh, features that can be uh, can make sure that everybody's data remains extraordinarily safe. And we have many documents on our in our help library about how to set up safe data collection and how to make sure that uh, you're making the most of the data safety procedures we use. So I would say the reason that we follow industry standards as strictly as we do is because uh, industries that have more money than the aid industry are, are even more invested in security than we are. Got it. Um, thank you so much, Annie, for that. The last question is how many agencies or governments have adopted your platform so far? So uh, at this point, six governments have adopted us at the national level that uh, includes at least one sector of their government moving towards national level. And that's where they encourage all the NGOs in their government, all the stakeholders, to help them create one uh, management ecosystem. Uh, we have 160 countries represented in our user base. We, just, uh, we had 158 up until two weeks ago. We just added Maldives and, uh, and Brunei. So we're at to 160. When we count our users, for our actual user accounts, it gets a little messy because some are in one office and some are individuals. We have 45,000 NGOs, government offices, uh, local community organizations, and researchers represented in accounts. But we look at their use and their metrics and their activity as much more of a, a, a reflection of what they're doing. And they're growing quite fast. At this time last year, we were collecting about 60,000 surveys a month, and now we're collecting 150,000 surveys a month. Wow. We know that our users are growing in their management and, and their activity exponentially. Are you there? Can't hear. I, I can't hear you now, Marielle. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Thank you, Annie. Yeah, I heard everything. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we're a fan of your tool, so we're very excited that more and more you know, countries and people are adopting. With, we're a fan of, of data-driven initiatives, and, and you guys are driving that, so congrats. Um, great. So I think we're almost at time, so we'll leave it at, at now. Thank you so much for attending. Um, please, you know, be sure if you want to obtain your PDA certificate using the link that I have on the slide right now on the screen. If you have any questions, please uh, contact us and don't forget to become members. Thank you so much, Annie, and thank you so much, Petri, for your time. Thank really you. Thank it. you. We look Thanks forward so to much. you any questions. Please do reach out to us. We're on Twitter and Facebook, and you can always email info at mwater.co. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.